Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. What is the greatest privilege that you have? And the best answer is this, the privilege of praising and worshiping God. If that is not how you would answer that question, what is your greatest privilege? Then you have a spiritual shortcoming in your life. You need to have your perspective change. And one book in the Bible that will go a long way in changing how we live, how we perceive things, how we think, is the book of Psalms. It is foundational for worship. It teaches us how to praise God and live a praiseworthy life. We're going to set out today on an exciting journey. It's a journey through all 150 Psalms. We're going to begin in Psalm 1, and my hope and objective is each week, to go through another section until we complete all the book of Psalms. And this is not going to be something that we can conclude in a few months or even a year. It is likely going to take between three and four years of weekly study to complete this wonderful book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms in Hebrew is called Sefer Tehillim. The book of Tehillim, which is praises. And this is what we have been saved and created anew to do, to praise God. So if you recognize that the greatest privilege you have, having been redeemed by God, is now an opportunity to worship Him in spirit and truth, to praise Him, to give glory unto Him, this is your objective. And you and I are called to do this at all times in all circumstances. And the book of Psalms is going to give us a great understanding of how and why and in all circumstances that we are called to do that to worship God. And let me give you a conclusion of this entire book. If you will not be moved away by the enemy in order to focus on your circumstances rather than on your call to glorify and worship and give thanks to God. In other words, if you remain steadfast in worshiping God as he demands to be worshiped, then you, when you look back at your life from an eternal perspective, you as well are going to be exceedingly pleased because no one who has lived a life of worshiping God will ever, ever regret it. No, those people who have done so, they are eternally thankful and they are reaping the eternal rewards of having done so. So the book of Psalms, you should be excited. Because we are going to see God's revelation on how to live an eternally pleasing life in order that God might be glorified and that you might be a recipient of his goodness forever and ever. So let's begin the book of Psalms in Psalm 1. The first thing that I would share with you is that the book of Psalms, obviously, they're all written in Hebrew. So we need to pay close attention to the Hebrew language. And the first thing that stands out about Hebrew poetry is that the primary characteristic of Hebrew poetry 
is parallelism, meaning one thing is likened to another. And someone might say, well, that's your opinion that this is likened to this. I think it's this other thing which is parallel to this. Well, you can have such debate if you look at it in a foreign language, meaning a language that's not Hebrew. But when you look at it in the Hebrew language, there are confirmations. There are grammatical indicators that reveal, not just suggest, but reveal what is parallel with something else. It's the grammatical construction that what is parallel with one another, they share. And that can be gender. It can be, be grammatical uh, uh, number. It can also be the condition of that, that verb or that noun. So we don't have to guess. One can be certain. Well, it'll be in our next study of Psalm 2 that I'm going to spend more time on parallelism. But, but I would imagine as we read Psalm 1 that you can see the parallelism. Let's begin. We read verse 1. Ashrei ha'ish. Ashrei is a term for being happy or being blessed. Now, in the New Covenant, and we know that the New Covenant was written in Greek. But when we take that Greek language and translate it into Hebrew, and we have the Hebrew New Covenant, well, in, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, we come across the Beatitudes. And, and all Hebrew scholars agree that it is proper to use this term ashray, where in the New Covenant it says in Matthew 5, blessed are the, the righteous or happy are the righteous. So it's this word ashray. And notice the next phrase, ashray ha-ish. Now the word ish is man, but the term ha-ish, listen to that, that syllable, ha, it is one letter in Hebrew, and it shows or it is used for the definite article. What does that mean? We're not speaking about a man, and this can be an inclusive term, man or woman. We're not talking about a woman, but the woman, a specific one. So what is being said here and revealed is only true for a specific person. Those who meet their criteria, the condition. And it's those who do so that are specifically mentioned. This psalm has relevance for. So let's begin. Blessed is the man who did not walk. And it's just that. Many put it into the present state. But we need to realize that we're talking about the use of what most uh, Christian scholars would say is the perfect tense, and that's fine. Modern Hebrew scholars would simply say it's in the past. But here's the truth. Oftentimes in Hebrew, we're not so much concerned with tense as present or past or future. We're looking at an event having to do with whether it has been completed or we're speaking about something in a predominantly general situation. This is the predominant way that someone walks. They've walked in this way, they are walking in this way, and they, for the most part, will continue to walk in this way. This is a, a definition. This reveals a predominant characteristic of that individual. So we read, this one is happy, he's blessed. Why? Because not did he stand, or excuse me, walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now, this is important because look at this word, counsel. Here, we need to make a statement. And that is, where do I find counsel for my life? What are the sources that I turn to that I embrace in making a decision? 
that, that sets me on a direction for my life. And here's the fact. Most individuals are not walking in the counsel of godly counselors, but rather they have been misled by satanic propaganda and they have walked in the counsel of wicked ones. And that's what this is warning us. So happy is the one, this man, who did not walk in the counsel of wicked ones. And in the way of sinners, he did not stand. So we see that his walk is not a walk that embraces wickedness, and his location, the journey, the pathway that he takes is not the pathway. He does not stand, and he has not stood in the way of sinners. Now, we see something here. We see that when we embrace wrong counsel, it is going to cause us to deal, do, behave in sin. In other words, unwise counsel, wicked counsel, produces sin in our life, and it positions us where we ought not be. Not in the place whereby we receive happiness and God's blessings. But here we find that if one walks in the counsel of wicked ones, he will find himself standing in the way of sinners. Not against sinners, but with sinners is the implication. So we want to be people that, that have walked not in the counsel of wicked. We want to be people that did not stand in the way of sinners. Or, keep reading, last of verse 1, or in the seat of, and this next word, as it says here, let's see, is the word for scoffers. The same word can be used to describe a clown, a person who lives frivolously, someone who does not take seriously the things of God, his instructions, his counsels, his commandments. So ask yourself, do I approach life in a frivolous manner? That I am not spiritually serious about the decisions I make? So it's very clear, in the seat of scoffers, he did not set. This is not where he finds himself. He finds himself entirely in a different way of living, in a different location, and on a different journey. And if we do not embrace that journey, then we're going to find ourselves not being happy, not being blessed by God, and not producing, and there's an emphasis here, on outcome. Not just an inward peace, but an outward performance. Now here again, I have to say this because I get so many emails from people warning me, chastising me, and I want to say I agree with them. Okay, we are not saved by performance. But do not make the faulty implication that so many make. That performance, God doesn't care about my performance. He cares about my heart condition. Well, he does care about our heart condition. And when we have a right heart condition, we are going to perform righteously. You see the connection? Right heart, righteous performance. And we're going to see here, undeniably, it's not speaking about how one is saved. It's speaking about how God's covenant people, specifically a new covenant people, one who are committed to praising God and living a praiseworthy life, how they perform. The result of their behavior. We'll see that in a moment. Look now to verse 2. Ki'im. Ki'im is two Hebrew words, because and if. But it forms an idiom. Ki'im, you can't translate these two words individually together. You have to recognize them 
in their, their use from an idiom point of view. And ke means rather. So rather, not, not doing what we talked about, but rather than, than walking in unwise counsel and standing in the ways of the sinner and being frivolous and unserious about life, rather we find the blessed one in the law of the Lord is his desire. Now, some will say delight, and that's fine, but it's the word chofetz in the verb form, which means to desire something. In, in ancient Hebrew, we have the word rotze and the word chofetz. Now, by and large, in modern Hebrew, predominantly we use the word rotze. But, but in the Bible, both appear, and the word chofetz speaks about a stronger, a more intense desire. So it's very important that it uses this word rather than rotze. So rather, in the law, this is the instruction. It's a reference to that group of commandments. Rather, in the law of the Lord is his desire. So again, we have to ask ourselves, what is the desire of my life? And a wise person, one who is being led by the Holy Spirit, one who has been baptized in the Holy Spirit, he is going to or she is going to have a strong desire for the law of the Lord. That's what the scripture is saying, being instructed by him. They will seek that. They will pursue that. They will study to understand God's instructions. And that's why it is so problematic when, when those who profess to be teachers of the Word of God handle the Word of God flippantly. We need to have a strong desire that leads to hours of work in, in preparing for sharing a teaching from Scripture. Rather, it says, in the law of the Lord is his desire. And in his law, meaning the law of the Lord, what does he do? Ye ge yomam va laila. He, probably one of the best ways to understand this term is the word for meditate. It is a word of pondering. Now, this word can also be related to the ancient Hebrew concept of philosophy. Not in the noun form, but philosophizing. And that requires much thinking, pondering, investigation, study. And that's what it's saying here. That one has a strong desire for the instruction of the Lord. And therefore, in that instruction... He ponders, he meditates, he studies. How often? Notice what it says. Day and night. Look now to verse 3. Verse 3 talks about why someone is going to be happy, why someone is blessed, and the manifestation of blessing. When I can claim these things, that I do not walk in wicked counsel, that I do not stand in the, the way of sinners, that my seat, my, my habitation is not in the place of, of scoffing the things of God, but rather my, my desire and the emphasis of my life is in uncovering the instruction, the wisdom, the truth of God. When that is a proper description of an individual, this is what this one can expect. Look now to verse 3. And it shall come about, or we could say, and he will be as a tree. So many times God likens human beings to trees. He says, and he shall be as a tree, but here's the key. Shatul, planted by the streams, palge mine, the channels or rivers of waters. Now, that's where a tree needs to be. If a tree doesn't have a good source of water, 
it's not going to be a healthy tree. So when we say, God, I am going to walk in wise counsel. I am going to, to make my way the way of the righteous. And I am going to be serious and demonstrate that seriousness by having the right desire. And having that desire manifest itself out by seeking your revelation. When that is true for an individual, it doesn't matter who that person is. When they have that desire and recognize this source as God's instruction, God's counsel, then that person can be assured that God will plant them in the right location where they can be recipients of the provision of God. And because one finds God's provision, what's the outcome? Whose fruit? And it says, which is fruit? We need to have fruit. This relates to the performance. And, and again, I get so much feedback from people saying, we ought not focus on performance. We need to focus on grace. Now, I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful or unkind or, or anything that's negative. But I want to admonish people in love. The grace of God is order not just to save us. That's true, and it's wonderful. But the grace of God works in my life to deny those things that will have an improper production, a wrong performance. Grace of God just doesn't save, but the grace of God produces fruits, and those fruits are good deeds, works that are in accordance with the laws of God, the commandments of God, the instruction of God. And this is not legalism. You know what it is? Spiritual maturity. So do not be one. This is displeasing to God. When someone is always panic-stricken, when someone talks about performance, your performance is important to God. In fact, your performance is going to be judged by Messiah to see if it's worthy of any crowns. So take Scripture seriously. Don't be flippant and superficial in your faith. Notice what the Psalms are saying. So this one, his fruit, it will be given, meaning he will give his fruit when in its season. And that term means in an appropriate time, in the right time. So in the same way that, that there's harvest time, and we rejoice, the harvest should be a source of joy. Read and we'll come to Psalms like Psalm 137 that speaks about the joy of harvest. Well, we need to have joy in recognizing the outcome of a righteous performance. And I'll say this. If, if you think a righteous performance is, is unspiritual, you have embraced a false teaching of the gospel. You don't know who Messiah truly is and how the Holy Spirit is speaking. You have been deceived. These are serious things. And, and sometimes we need to, to shake people up and to speak conviction, not just encouragement, but conviction to individuals. He says here, for his fruit he will give in season. And his leaf or leaves, literally his leaf will not uh, uh, wither up. And all, notice this, this is emphatic. And everything which he will do will succeed. Now, this word for success, in Hebrew, this is the verb, it is telling us of God's promise. Why will I be blessed? Why will I be happy? Because I'm going to be producing fruit when God desires that fruit to be manifested. At the harvest time, 
and I am going to have success. What is success? Well, don't believe false teachers. Success is accomplishing the purposes of God. Just that simple. Success has nothing to do with your bank account. Now, does God sometimes richly bless people financially as an outcome of their faithfulness? Yes, and praise God for that. But realize, success can and should be measured in a variety of ways. And what happens is this. Generally, success is accomplishing God's will. And God blesses one who is spiritually successful. That means good deeds, right performance, in a, in a multiplicity of ways. Sometimes it is financially. Sometimes it's, it's a variety of other things that God will do. Let's move on. Look now to, to verse 4. He's showing a contrast. This is what one who is wise does. But in contrast to that, this, he says, verse 4, Lochen, not so the wicked ones. Rather, that same phrase, ki'im, rather, as a, a chef. Now, we know that there is a, a grain, and you have to rem remove the chef from the kernel, the grain. And what do you do with that chef? You throw it away. It's, it's driven away. It's useless. So we want to make sure that we're not useless but useful. We want to be people that produces fruit, that is that grain, which provides spiritual nourishment. It is a positive spiritual influence in people's lives in a given situation. And not be producing what is disregarded. So we read in verse 4, Not so the wicked, rather as the shaft which is driven away by the wind. Now, what this speaks of is this. Those who are wicked, they have instability in their life. They don't have the anchors which keeps them standing in that right location. The enemy, Satan, he's diabolical, that is the devil. He deceives the father of lives. And what is his desire? This is how he works. He wants to get you to listen to unwise counsel. He wants to position you in the way of sinners. And he wants you to be frivolous, unserious about the things of God so that you're not positioned in God's provision and you can't live a fruitful life. And one of the signs of that is that there's no anchor stability and you are easily moved from one thing to another. There's no, here's an important spiritual word, consistency in your life verse verse 5 not so again he says that same thing not so or literally al ken which is better therefore same phrase but there's a grammatical difference uh, um, in this case so it says therefore the wicked will not rise in judgment. Meaning this, the wicked will not be received, will not be recognized by God in a way that is positive. They will not stand through the judgment, but judgment, God's judgment will condemn them and eternally, and I want to emphasize that, eternally destroy them eternal destruction, eternal punishment. So, so not so these who are wicked. They will not stand. They do not stand in judgment. And sinners, they won't be found where? And sinners in the council, or excuse me, adat is the congregation of the righteous. So we see things, the, the dichotomy, the difference between wicked and righteous ones. And let me point out, elsewhere in the scriptures, in the book of Psalms, and also in the book of Proverbs, and 
prophetically we see this. There is a connection, there is parallelism between the term, term for, for righteous and in the law. That's why Paul says, those who walk not in the flesh, but in the spirit, they fulfill the righteousness of the law. Paul, having been an expert in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, brings these same things into the new covenant inspired by the Holy Spirit to reveal them to believers. So we see, therefore, the wicked will not rise up in judgment and sinners in the, the congregation of the righteous. Why not? Verse, verse 6, our final verse. This speaks about the, the omniscience of God. He knows all things. And we read, for the Lord knows. Very important, that, that grammatical construction. It's yodea. The present, or someone's called a participle. Don't have to really argue about this, but, but this grammatical construction. However, the scholars choose to identify it. Usually Jewish scholars one way, Christian scholars another, but it's just terminology in regard to the same grammatical construction. They agree upon the meaning of that grammatical construction, just different terms. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. And it's not definite, it's a way of the righteous, meaning wherever he goes, God knows. God does not ever disconnect himself from the righteous one. So God knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked ones, the way of the wicked ones perish, will perish, will be destroyed. So here's what we need to realize. We can either walk, live, it's a lifestyle, under the providence under the supervision of God, and that's a righteous way. It is a way that, that is rooted in the revelation of God, that lives to a performance that is pleasing to God, good fruit. Or we reject that, and we embrace the counsel of wickedness. We, we walk in the way of sinfulness, we are frivolous, unserious about the things of God, flippant with the word of God, and, and not meditating upon the truth of God. And when we are living in that way, what God's warning us is that is a way that leads to destruction. So are you on the way of the righteous or on the way of the wicked? Are you going to be under God's providential supervision or are you on a pathway that leads to eternal destruction? Just that simple. God makes it diverse, does he not? Not much similarity between this and that. Choose wisely. Make a commitment right now, oh God, as we bow our heads, we pray to you that we might be individuals that are passionate about praising you, that we understand that our greatest privilege is our call to worship you. And God, we want to utilize that privilege. We want to be serious about that privilege. We want to be people that live a life that is glorifying to you. For this is our prayer. In Yeshua's name, amen. Well, we've closed. Until next week, may God richly bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>